John chapter number 13, verse 35, um, 34, John 13, 34. This is Jesus um, about to experience uh, predicting that Peter is about to deny him. But John 13, 34 and 35 is a very important, um, uh, you may need some notepad, paper, pen, or if you have a note section in your iPhone, you can do that. If you have a tablet, you can use that. If you have a, a, a Galaxy, you can use that. If you have an Android device, you can use whatever section they give you guys to, to do that. All right? It's notes. All right. Let me give you a second so your phone can finish freezing, and then you can operate. All right? All right. Okay, so John, this is going to help you. You may need to replay this back later down the line, down the week, but it's going it's to be very helpful for you. Um, John 13, 34. Hey, Miss Danielle. I'm dedicating your house this week. Uh, John 13, 34. It says this, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. Somebody say must. must. Type it in the chat, say must. must. Type it in the chat, say must. It's kind of cool how I say type it in the chat and you still respond must. That's kind of funny. Anyway, um, but by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Right, that, that is a commandment that Jesus gives that was, that was new for the group because they were used to having commandments and they knew all of the commandments. It was something that you grew up knowing. And then it says in uh, 1 John 4, 8, just write the note, it's not going to be on the screen. It says, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. John three sixteen says, for God so Right. Okay, so let me give you my introduction. This morning, I want to dive into this sermon titled called Loving While Losing. It may sound paradoxical, but there is a great validity in it. First, love is a word so loosely used, I personally don't take it to heart when said. Some people use the word love for everything. I love football. I love tennis. I love chicken wings. I love oxtails. I love spaghetti. I love grits. Don't put sugar on it. I love grits. I, I love whatever it is that you love. We just use the terminology so flippantly. Here's the reality. Some people who use the word love treat objects of their love as enemies. Love does not boast, love is not prideful, love does not ignore. In Greek culture, they had a myriad of words for love. And each person would use the right word for love to define the love that they meant. In America, we read the scripture like Americans. And we enter the text when we see love, it means what it means in America. We use love for everything. The reality is most individuals will never match the love you give them. You and I have to accept that. Secondly, love is a measuring stick by which God can affirm that you carry his DNA. I want to do a word study on this word this morning on how we are to properly follow God, love people. And I want to pull a few disciples who were employees of Jesus, teammates of Jesus, friends of Jesus, mentees of Jesus, and show you some of their characteristics to showcase, not all of them, showing some characteristics of showing how you have to learn how to love while you're still yet losing. When you give, technically you are losing, maybe not forever, but in that moment you are. The greatest way to be used by God is to love people. And the greatest way to be used is to love people. The greatest way to be damaged is also to love people. 
So the same place that can bring you great pleasure can also bring you great pain. We are called to love that which can probably hurt, but let's discuss the proper love we should give as a church and how we are supposed to love as individual Christians in our community. If you are a leader, soon to be business owner, parent, friend, believer, you will need to replay this message. Here is a quick nugget before we dive into this. People keep a long mental note of your wrong and keep a short memory of your good. People keep a long mental note of your wrong and keep a short mental note of your good. So let me tell you the different words for good, for love. There was this word called storge, which is the Greek. So if, if it was a love for family, they would say storge. Storge is the type of love for family that's different because um, storge means I love you because you're kin to me. That's very dangerous because some of us are indebted to our families because of storge. I'm supposed to love you because you're family. But just because you're family doesn't mean that you're really kin to me. Blood doesn't always make us close, it just makes us related. Blood doesn't always make us close, it just makes us related. And so because of Storhe, a lot of us do things for family that is hurting us while helping them. Then we move into this different type of love. So scriptures, whenever you see scripture talk about love, it's not talking about this type of love, storge. It's neither talking about this type of love, eros. Eros is that passionate, sensual love that you need in a relationship. Okay, you don't have eros love, hopefully, for family. That would be weird. You have it for your spouse. And so you see how it helps to know what type of love you're talking about? Because people will tell you all the time, I love you. I need to know which type of love you mean. Because some people only love you as long as you're right. When people say, I'm with you when you're right. So what happens when I'm wrong? So love is not just this, this broad terminology that we use. Love means something and you need to know what type of love people are talking about. Then you have this philia love, which we get the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia, which is a brotherly love, this, this type of friend love, David and Jonathan type love. I love you because you're like a friend, you're like a brother, I, I, you know, you're, you're, my, you're my peoples, I love you. It doesn't mean I love you like I want to marry you, it means I just love you as an individual, right? So you need to know which one people are saying, because sometimes you... You talking to a friend that you think is supposed to be more than a friend and you eros loving them and they just like, no, this is Philadelphia type love. We need to be clear because there's nothing worse than having an expectation that's not being met by someone who has a different expectation. Right? That's why it's clear. We need to be clear on relationships. What do you expect from me? Does friendship mean that I call you every day? Does friendship just mean I'm there when it matters? We need to define what that looks like because a lot of us are cutting people off and cancel culture, not because they're not friends, but your expectation was never communicated and your expectation was wrong. And we're ruining great relationships because we don't know how to properly explain or express where we wanna be as it relates to relationship. But I do want to give you this one. That's the one that all of us universally as Christians must have. It's the one found in John 13, chapter number 35. It's the one found in 1 John, chapter number 4, verse 8. It's used 200 times throughout Scripture. It is the word called agape. It is used 200 times throughout Scripture. It is a word called agape. It is used 200 times throughout Scripture. It is a word called agape. If anything is used that much, it must be significant. 365 times God tells us to fear not. That means it's significant. Why? What are most people bound by? Fear. The only reason why most people don't try anything different is because of what? Fear. Fear. Yesterday I did something a little different that I normally don't do. One of my guy's brothers that I love, he's, his, his birthday was yesterday, so they went ATV in. And um, I don't ATV because... Um, when I was ATVing, when I first got married, we were in Jamaica and I almost fell off a cliff. 
Judge your mama, don't judge me. Okay, so, <laughs> so no, here's what, so when I, when I was ATV and I almost fell off a cliff and because of that moment, the only reason why I did not fall off the cliff into a big old ocean is because the back of the tire got stuck in mud. And that was the only reason why. So I jumped off the ATV, the ATV's dangling and I, the tourist guy says, what about my ATV? I says, what about my life? So ATVing was just something I didn't want to do. And so they asked about ATVing and I was going to cancel. I had already paid and I was going to make up that I was sick. I was going to just cough and say I have the virus or something. I don't know. I was going to do something. But I said, I said this. I said, no. I said, I don't want to go. And then this anxiety comes over me because of what? Fear. Fear will do that to you. And so that, that's why it's important that we listen to Scripture when scripture says certain things, it means it because it knows we're going to need it. So here it is. It's about agape. So Jesus has 12 disciples, and he's got to learn how to work with them to accomplish the mission, which is to follow God, ultimately to love people and change everybody he comes into contact with. But he's got to learn how to love these people with agape love. Agape love means this, which is very important for you and I to know. Agape love means this. It's, it's, it refers to pure, willful, sacrificial love that intentionally desires another's highest good. Agape isn't born just out of emotions, feelings, familiarity, or attraction, but from the will and as a choice. Agape is a choice. Every day, you and I are going to be faced with a choice of, do I love again? And some of us have been so burned that the idea of, lo remember not loving and dating, I'm talking about the idea of loving again after I've given my all to somebody and they play you or take advantage of you, it is very difficult to give it to somebody else again. That's how the devil tricks us. It does not mean that if you take advantage of me, I keep on letting you take advantage of me. Scripture is very clear. Um, if someone hits you, turn the other cheek. It doesn't mean to literally turn the other cheek. If it meant that, it just also says a few verses down that if someone plucks you in your eye, if your right eye offends you, pluck it out. I don't see nobody doing that. It's simply telling you to go to the highest measure that you can to avoid conflict. But how Satan gets us trapped is he gets us so hurt that we don't want to help anybody else again. And agape is a choice that we make. Now let's go through some of people, some of the people that Jesus had to deal with. And the disciples are all males. I'm not saying that females are not, there are not traits, but I'm talking about the disciples and these are they. Okay. So here's the first one. He has a friend, a member of his group called Philip and Andrew. They're two of the same. Notice that there's 12 disciples, but each in the disciple group, they all have cliques. Whenever people get together, cliques will happen. It's amazing when people say, I don't like church because it's clickish. Your job is a click. You don't talk to everybody on the job. You greet everybody on the job, but you got that one person, you talk about everything that happened during the week and all that because we form as a social construct, we formulate relationships with people who have similarities to us. But Andrew and Peter, were Andrew and Philip were two unique individuals. When Jesus was feeding the 5,000, Jesus did not ask Peter how to feed them. He asked Andrew and Philip. And it's a great book written by John MacArthur called 12, Ord 12 Ordinary Men that describes why Jesus picks these individuals. And Philip and Andrew say to Jesus, um, we don't have enough to feed all these people. And they were right, but they were also wrong because they gave Jesus a fact, but that's not the truth. The fact is we may not have enough, but the truth is you can do whatever you want to do. We got to learn how to love the Philip and Andrews that always want to tell us the facts without having optimism for our future. It is very difficult to love people who only see negativity, but you are still required to love them even though they do not see the best or the highest for you and I. Remember, agape is I want to see the highest and best use of your life. So this person is this way. I got a question. Um, I want to start, start doing jobs partnership. 
You know your credit ain't good. How are you going to be teaching people about credit and your credit bad? And immediately when they give you that response, you get offended, number one. You remove back from what you should have done. And then a part of you stops loving the way you should and stops sharing what you should because you feel like every time I share, you kill it. You still got to learn how to love those people because they're not going to go away. And Jesus, can you imagine doing ministry? I'm about to heal this person. But Jesus, you know they ain't got insurance. You know the hospitals are full, Jesus. You might want to think twice about it. You better not touch them, Jesus, because you could catch a virus because there was leprosy in that time and you couldn't touch people if they had leprosy. You and I got to learn how to love people who don't agree with us. I, uh, I, I know I done lost a whole bunch of people right there because all we like to do is dislike people who don't agree with us. We like to unfriend people who don't agree with us. We like to cancel people who don't agree with us. The reality of life is this. You will deal with people even in your friendship circles or even in your family that will always tell you the facts about yourself. And you've got to be okay with the fact that they said, I don't think you could do that because you didn't pass college. That is a true fact. But I still got to learn how to love people who don't see the highest best for me and only see negativity. Some people are not just trying to be negative. That's just who they are. How many of you met people who are just negative? That's just who they are. <laughs> Let's go. Thomas, you got to learn to love people who doubt everything you do. Hey, let me tell you what I'm about to do. I'm about to start a restaurant. Why would you do that? Ain't nobody coming to eat your food. I'm about to evangelize to this person about the gospel. Why would they want to listen to you? You don't even speak well. Thomas was with Jesus and he said to Jesus, he said, listen, and I agree with Thomas. I know he gets a bad rep, but the reality is, is many of us do struggle in our faith. And the good thing about Jesus is he picks people on his team that is able to relate to you and I. Because not every single day of our lives we believe. Thomas is the one that needs proof in order for it to be real. You got to learn how to love people who do not see what you see and they always need proof. I'm about to buy a house, I promise you. Well, I believe it when I see it. How discouraging is that? That I just put my dream out there and you just crushed it. I expect my adversaries to do that. But Thomas is the same. He will always doubt what you have until he sees it into fruition. You got to learn how to love agape love. You got to choose to love because even if they don't believe, God will raise up someone else who does. Here's how to love properly and love well with all your heart. Love, write this down, without expectation. You know why you're offended? Because you love with expectation. It's natural to love with expectation. That's what we're supposed to do. But the reality is most people will not love you to the degree that you love them. I can't believe they didn't come back and tell me thank you. You should have did it knowing that they weren't going to come back and tell you thank you. If I loan you money, I have in the back of my mind that you will not pay me back. Because I loaned it to you with the expectation of not getting it back. That's why you don't loan what you can't afford. We have got to learn how to love without expectation. How could you do this to me? I gave you all of this. Get it out your mind. You got to learn how to love without expectation. Because if you start loving with expectation, when people don't meet your expectation, you're going to stop loving. Because agape love is a choice. And every day you live, God's saying, I want you to choose love. I want you to choose love because you don't know when you choose to love you are choosing to obey God God said pay for their groceries I ain't paying for their groceries I saw how they rolled their eyes at me you don't know what God's trying to do for you if you would just obey him and do what he said to do that's what agape love is I'm not loving you because you want to be loved I'm loving you because I'm trying to keep my heart pure gotta learn how to love the Thomases <laughs> Here's the next one. It's going to get rough. Um, you got to learn how to love the Peters. Peter is, Peter is very temperamental. He is the one that's going to blow up and get angry. He is the one that's going to respond and then apologize. 
Peter cuts a man's ear off and Jesus says, I don't need you to do that. He picks up the man's ear way before the Verizon commercial says, can you hear me now? He puts it back on his ear and the man's able to hear. You and I got to love people who say things that they don't mean, but they say it when they're angry. You and I could be one of them. So don't just think about somebody else that does that. You might be that person. You got to learn how to love people who have angry fits. Pastor, I was with you. But remember, love is a choice. And that's something that we need to pray about because a lot of us don't pray that God help me to love better. Because we don't want to love better. We just want to cut everybody off. But what if you're cutting off your supply of what God's trying to do in your life? Now, that doesn't mean you take abuse from people that just keep going off on you. It simply means this. You've got to make a choice not to let your heart grow cold. Because some of you love God. You just don't love anybody else. And as a country... We got to learn how to love not just amendments, but the commandments. We have to learn how to love people, even if they differ from you politically. Because, okay, everyone is made in the Imago Dei, the image of God, which means when God created all of us, he made us all in his image. Now, some of us have distorted ideologies and all that. I'm not talking about that, but we need to learn how to love people beyond their positions. Why are we missing God? Because we only want to love people who agree with us in the season of life that we're in. Remember this, how you think today, you may not think the same way 10 years from now. Agape love is learning how to love those who blow up and get angry. We don't know the root cause of their anger. Then you got to learn how to love. This guy's a very interesting guy. He's John the Beloved. He seems to be very easy to love because he's always on the bosom of Jesus. It's easy to love people who always want to show you the highest and best regard of who you are. They make you feel valuable. That's the type of Christian we should be. When people leave our presence, they say, I wish I was in their presence more. That's a question that we got to ask ourselves. Do people feel better when they're around us? Or are people just a pawn in your game to destiny? So, so here's... <laughs> Let's go with this guy. John the Beloved is a, is a disciple of Jesus. I would believe that John feeds Jesus because you can't just give love and not receive love. Some of you, let me help you, you're great at giving it, you're just not good at receiving it. And you've been praying, Lord, send me, send me something in the name of Jesus. And God send it to you and you keep rejecting it and you're cloaking it under the auspice of humility when really it's pride. There are so many Christians that cloak humility and it's all pride. Oh no, I don't, I don't want to ask you for any money. I'm, I'm good. I don't want to ask you. I don't want to ask you for anything. I don't, I don't need any gas money. Your light is on E, it's blinking. It's even speaking in tongues, saying, I need some gas. E Canada 89 in a Honda. All of these things, and you're still saying, I don't need any help. That is not humility, that is pride. I'm just trusting God. Well, maybe God sent me as the answer to your trust in Him. I was talking to a gentleman in our office um, last Friday, and he's a giver. And I said, hey, man, I'm going to give you an office. And he said, well, I know you're about to charge for the offices, so I don't know how much I'm going to have to pay. I said, um, no, you ain't got to pay none. I'm going to give you an office. He says, okay, so you're going to give me an office. So what do I have to do to get this office? 
no, I'm going to, we all started laughing because we're like, maybe he doesn't understand English. I said, I'm going to give you an office. He said, yeah, I know you said you're going to give me an office, but man, I don't know. If you give me an office, I mean, what do I really got to do for this office? And I said, I got it. You don't know how to receive. You've mastered the art of giving, but have not yet mastered the art to receive. And that's many of us in this room. When you get, and you and I get to heaven, God's going to be like, I gave you a whole bunch of stuff. You kept on turning it down. Trying to show your piety when really it wasn't piety, it was pride. The next one, James and John. These guys, the sons of Zebedee, they're an interesting group. You've got to learn how to love people who only see you for an opportunity. They went to Jesus' mother and said, uh, <coughs> mother, mother Jesus, can we have a conversation with you? She said, sure. You know, I know your son is Jesus. I want to know, can you make sure when he gets to heaven, we get a seat at the gate? Now, I know all the other disciples are around, but make sure we get the, the, the seat next to him. Because really, Jesus, for some of the disciples, was a ride into political power. You got to be careful that you got to learn how to love people who you know are trying to use you. They don't love you. They love what you can do for them. Don't get it twisted. No, no, don't get it twisted. They don't love you. They love what your access gets them. If you don't learn how to love, you'll close yourself off from people. And the people who do need your bread will starve because of what other people have done to you. Somebody say, Lord, help my heart. <laughs> Listen, y'all, this is not an easy thing. Every day you wake up, you're like, Lord, help me to love. Because people could become draining and you could live a life where you just say, you know what, I don't want to deal with people. I'm going to live on an island by myself. I'm going to do my own thing. Because remember this, people will never love you the way you love them. Amen. You've got to learn how to love. A, I choose to love you even though I know you're a user. You only call when you need something. You only text when you need something. And it always starts like this. Hey, man, I was thinking about you. The Lord, if you're saved, they say it like this. The Lord had dropped you in my spirit. When they say that, they're about to ask you for some money. You already know what it is. The Lord had placed you in my heart. And I just, and then once you do for them, you never hear from them again until their next request. You got to choose to learn to love people even though loving them hurts you. Now, I'm not saying, oh man, what, how was church? Man, pastor told me to stay with you even though you're hurting me. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying you got to learn how to choose to love even when it seems like people are different than you. This is the last one and it's the hard one. You got to learn to love Judas too. All right, let's all go to the altar. You got to, you got to, you don't need no music on this one. You, you got to love, you got to learn to love Judas too. Can you imagine? I fed you. I helped you when no one wanted to help you. I chose you when nobody would pick you. You sat at my table at Thanksgiving. We ate the last supper together. I gave you my drink. You laid your head on my chest and said, I will be with you always. You shared everything I've done. Retweeted 
the things that I said. Text your friends and told them how awesome this person is in your life. And when the opportunity presented itself, a man came and said, hey, I know you be around that Jesus guy. He really real? Yeah, he does. Does he feed people? Yes, he does. Has he done miracles? I've seen it with my own eyes. You've really seen him heal people. I've seen it. I've seen demons run. And then a woman comes and puts perfume at his feet. And he's offended because he says, imagine what we could do for the poor. But in reality, he was giving us a clue of his betrayal. Because if you're so used to loving people, you ignore the clues that they're out the door. Y'all ain't talking to me this morning. And so Judas gets an offer for 30 pieces of silver. If you betray him, and can you imagine Jesus thinking about, I'm about to die. You got 24 hours to live. You're about to die. What you going to do? I'm about to die, and I'm in the garden. All my disciples are around me, and they praying with me. He Father, in the name of Jesus, keep our master alive in the name of And I hear Judas praying, too. Father, please. Keep the master alive, all the while knowing I sold him for 30 pieces of silver. What makes it worse is you sold Jesus for the price of a slave. If you were going to sell me out, at least sell me out for my value. Ooh, there's nothing that hurts more than to know you betrayed me for that. I wrote that some people in the Old Testament betrayed Jesus for coins. In today's culture, they betray you for clout. <laughs> and Jesus walks into the garden. And then the soldiers come and they say, we don't know which one he is because Jesus blended in with the rest of them, which is a message in itself that you don't have to be dressed like a priest to affect the common. But Jesus was so knitted to loving people, they couldn't figure out which one is he. I know you want to show us your anointing by your vocabulary, but we know your anointing by how you love. And he loved so good that Pharisees hated him. Loved so good the poor wanted to be around him. And they said, who is this man? And when it came time, for them to discover him. It was bad enough you made the deal. But maybe marching along the way you would have said, Nate, I'm not going to do this to him. He's done so much for me. But, but then they, he, he walks in and they say, well, we, we can't figure him out. Judas, can you help us? And he says... I'm going to help him. I'm going to show you who he is by giving him a kiss. Can I ask you a question? How many people have kissed you and have already sold you? And he walks up to Jesus and Jesus probably thinking, 
and already knows because he's the Messiah, but he receives the kiss. And the disciples are probably thinking, oh, what a, what a great guy. What an amazing man. He came to kiss the Savior. And all along the kiss was to kill his heart. Jesus, I believe, yes, he died on the cross, but he probably died in the garden too. There's nothing that will test your love walk than when the people who kissed you kill you. And I've, I've been there, I've seen it, I've walked through it, I've done it 13 years, done this a long time, and been preaching since I was 12 years old. I done seen it all, heard it all. And this is the word I want to give. My pastor gives me this, and this is the source of my life, the source of my strength outside of Scripture. I want you to write this down. It may be on the screens. He says this all the time, and it's so important. If you open up yourself to people, your heart will be broken but it will stay warm. If you keep away from people, your heart will never be broken, but it'll grow cold. Say it one more time. If you open yourself up to people, your heart will be broken, but it will stay warm. If you keep away from people, your heart will never be broken but it'll grow cold. My assignment is just this, to talk to the cold-hearted. God's blessed you. And you've been through so much and you have a right to be upset about all that's happened, but you don't have a right to grow cold. And I don't care if you got to cry out every day, Lord, help my heart. Lord, help my heart. Do it until it gets warm. Because if Jesus would have let Judas' decision stop him, we wouldn't be here today. It hurts. And you may never get over it. And you may be a little bit more cautious. But if your heart grows cold, the greatest instrument that we can give to God is not our, our, our skill, it's our heart. And if you don't have a heart to give that's warm, it's going to be hard for God to use you to the maximum. I would sum it up with this. A man called and said, PD, what, what, do you, what, do you, what do you explain? What do you think? I said, outside of all the favor of God is that every time my heart tries to grow cold, I remind myself of this phrase that told me. If your heart grows cold, you'll never be used at the optimum that God wants to. If your heart is warm, it will get broken but it will stay warm. You know why intercessors can pray with people and not even care if you die? Because their heart's cold. You got to learn how to keep this heart warm. And so I want to pray. I know there probably are a sea of you online and those in the sanctuary like, PD, that, woo, I need help on that. And we all do. It's not... It's not just this simple, I forgive you. It's agape is a choice that I make. I choose to love you. Remember, forgiveness does not mean an absolving of consequence. But I want to pray with you. Because if you're leading, you got to learn how to love while losing. It's part of the journey. And Christ doesn't hide it from us. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you help those in this room and myself included to love warm, to love while losing, to love while failing. God, there are people that we thought of in this sermon, but God, sometimes we're the Judas, sometimes we're the betrayer. So God, sometimes we need the mercy that we're asking others to get. Help my agape to line up with yours. 
that according to John 13, 35, that you will know that I loved you by the way that I love one another, agapo, the way that I loved. Help me to love. Help me to love. Help me to love. God, help us to love. Love doesn't mean a tolerance. Love does not always mean an agreement. But help us to love the Imago day of people that you created in the likeness and the image of God according to Genesis 2-7. Help us to love those that we've helped. Help us to follow God, love people, and change our city. In Jesus' name. If you receive that, would you clap your hands this morning? Yeah.